From the Toronto Star, I'm Reggie Mudler, and this matters. If we don't create the thing that kills Facebook, something else will. That is reportedly a line from Facebook's orientation guide for new employees. It's an acknowledgement that nothing lasts forever in the world of social media and looks a little bit different in the context of the latest news regarding the social network. Last week, the Federal Trade Commission and 48 U.S. state attorney generals launched an antitrust lawsuit charging that Facebook had engaged in monopolistic actions that stifled competition. And one of the potential remedies is forcing the company to unwind its acquisitions of Instagram and WhatsApp. Facebook bought Instagram in 2012 for $1 billion and WhatsApp in 2014 for $19 billion. And these were deals that the FTC let happen at the time. So why now? And is this the first real sign that perhaps big tech is going to face regulation and some harsh consequences? We are joined by John Biggs, editor-in-chief of Gizmodo, to discuss what all this means, what happens next, and if Facebook just might have to unfriend Instagram and WhatsApp. John, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, John, this was just announced last week. It's the FTC and I believe 48 attorney generals. You know, it's a lawsuit right now. And I just want to start with what was your initial reaction when you heard about this? I mean, what part of it do you find most interesting? Well, I mean, look, so the part I find most interesting that's happening right about now during a period in American politics where the online is encroaching ever more intensely on the political and into real life. So it used to be that what happened online kind of stayed online. I think now the fact is, is that all communications are happening online. Twitter has become the de facto messaging platform of our outgoing president. And the belief that these companies have more power than we originally thought is becoming more prevalent in the same way that Bell and Microsoft, when you basically control every single printing press out there, people start to get worried. And whether rightly or wrongly is the ultimate question. And where we go with that is the second question. Well, I want to get into a little bit of the basics, you know, as this is an antitrust investigation, and obviously Facebook has disrupted so many industries up until this point, but this is very specifically pointed at social advertising. I believe that Facebook and the U.S. tech industry are a force for innovation and empowering people. But I recognize that there are concerns about the size and power of tech companies. Our services are about connection and our business model is advertising and we face intense competition in both. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means and why the focus is there? So the belief here is that Facebook owns so many ways of monetizing users that it's become a monopoly on that front. They own Instagram, they also own the site itself, and they own a number of other things, including WhatsApp. So you basically have a bundle of services that are attacking consumers in different ways. But the assumption there is that once you have that bundle of services, you either cut out competition, which is a big issue, or you're in complete control of, of the marketplace. So that's what we're talking about here. Social advertising, it seems to be like a bit of a big thing. I think the other thing is we have to talk about the other elephant in the room. Can't Facebook just point to the fact that Google exists and controls a huge part of advertising? Isn't that an immediate defense for this, potentially? The expectation here is that we're, I think we're talking a little bit more about communications as opposed to tools. Google is going to say, and, and by all means, I mean, let's break up Google as well if we have the opportunity. But the fact is, is you have a certain number of tools associated with Facebook that you don't really have associated with Google. And also Google could feasibly come back and say, hey, look, you guys destroyed Google Plus for us, which was their short-lived social network. And so it's definitely not our fault that Facebook has all this power. The biggest question here is the tendency for Facebook to buy up competitors, which could be seen as anti-competitive, right? So if you're looking at a, what Facebook does, they bought up WhatsApp, they bought up Instagram, and they're buying up all these other little startups, which is 100% the model of Silicon Valley, but it's definitely not the model of the traditional business world where you just don't have the cash to do that. And this is the big deal, right? The real talk in this lawsuit is sort of to make things right, is to potentially unwind these acquisitions of Instagram and WhatsApp. But these things happened like, what, 
five years ago, I think seven for Instagram. 2012 was Instagram. And I believe it was a $19 billion sale for WhatsApp. It's one of these things I remember Zuckerberg famously saying that he wasn't going to integrate these businesses. Our mission around Instagram is we think Instagram is amazing and we want to help it grow to hundreds of millions of users. We have no agenda in terms of making them go into our infrastructure or something. And a lot of times companies force companies that they're integrating to do stuff like that. I think it's primarily a waste of time. He obviously has right now. Can these things be unwound? Realistically? Technically, I mean, if it depends on what you consider unwound, and, and it also depends on stuff that we can't see from where we, you and I are sitting, right? So let's say I'm on Instagram and I'm sharing photos and things, and all of a sudden the Facebook algorithm starts showing me things that I'm interested in on Facebook proper or starts advertising to me on WhatsApp using these tools. That's kind of like the scary thing that we're talking about here. But for all intents and purposes, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Facebook are actually usable without having any connection to Facebook itself. I don't have a Facebook account as far as I can tell anymore. I don't know. They don't really let you delete your account, which is a whole different story. I don't use Facebook, nor do I use Instagram. I still use WhatsApp just for kicks, but I haven't seen any real connection there. So yeah, you can live in a world where those things aren't connected. Also, given the technical expertise of the average politician, I'm pretty sure that these guys don't know what they're talking about, but it's nice of them to keep, I guess, the consumer in mind when they talk about this stuff. The FTC approved these acquisitions when they happened. Wouldn't it have been a better thing to stop it then? Those were the go-go days of 2012. So you're looking at a bust that essentially destroyed the world economy for a brief period about four years before. So anything that sounds good and exciting in that context is definitely something that people wanted. We basically come back to these things when times are good. Obviously, 2020 is a very, very weird year because to a degree, the, the stock market is booming, whereas the world is suffering. But if we're talking from a business sense, this is the time to start looking at these things as opposed to a couple of years ago when startups were the darlings of everyone. The perception was that anybody could become a um, Silicon Valley. You had Silicon Prairie, you had all this other stuff popping up around the world where governments and private industry was trying to work together to create sort of these, these startup incubators. And they loved stories like WhatsApp because it was a couple guys who said, hey, let's make a uh, communications app. And then they got sold for $19 billion. So every single politician a couple of years ago really, really liked these things to happen. Now that we have an outgoing president who's a little bit sassy, a little bit salty when it comes to social media, and now that things are kind of booming, it seems like a good time to strike. What has Facebook's response been so far? And anything surprising about it to you at this point? These guys have more lawyers than the FTC, I suspect. So they haven't reacted in any way that's not particularly surprising. So far, obviously, they said that it pretty much can't be broken up and that they're going to fight it for as long as they can. I think probably one of the things here is, is that if we can imagine this company's actually being broken up, it kind of leaves Facebook the most screwed, right? Even though they're probably the biggest, they're the ones that's considered, you know, a little bit older and doesn't have the cachet of, say, the other two. You think that's fair to say? I mean, I would argue that almost all of the pieces of the Facebook empire are losing their luster. When Microsoft was accused of monopolistic behavior, it was in the 2000s, it was the go-go 2000s, there was a lot of energy behind tech. And the thinking was that you had that you had two parts to Microsoft, which was the operating system and then the all the other software, which is basically Office for all intents and purposes. But at that point, the technology was moving very, very quickly. Microsoft was kind of at a loss to keep up. There were smaller companies that were lapping it constantly, but they were still being attacked for being monopolistic. The concern here is we're in kind of the same situation. Facebook is a completely mature technology at this point. It's not going to get any better. It's not going to get any worse. The only thing that's going to happen is that the user is going to get more and more frustrated with it and move on to something else. This is sort of its last gasp of credibility until maybe it can turn itself around like a Microsoft did actually turn itself around down the line. We'll be right back. Thank you. 
as a strategy, I mean, I think the Microsoft one, and I remember famously, this is one of those things where like Bill Gates didn't take it seriously going in. Like there's a famous line where he said that he was going to hit his head on the stairs. Maybe that might be one of the problems. And then of course it turned into this years long battle, which then made them very wary of acquiring any other companies. It really had an effect on their business. Does that look like probably what's going to happen with Facebook in the sense that they're probably going to try and drag this out forever. But if they ever want to buy anything, it's going to face an incredible amount of scrutiny? Most likely. Microsoft was able to turn itself around because it started exploring hardware. It started exploring new methodologies. Back in 1999, when this was all happening for Microsoft, it was Windows or nothing. You basically had fear, uncertainty, and doubt. People were discouraged from using different tools. Now Microsoft is completely embracing the innovative tech stack. Can Facebook do that? No, it can't, unfortunately, because... Facebook's primary product is basically the social network. Technically, it has all this other stuff associated with it, the Oculus, which potentially could stick us all into some kind of Facebook branded virtual world where we talk to each other, WhatsApp communications, all that other good stuff. But it just doesn't have the same technical chops and the same world beating energy. Absolutely, it has a huge population. It's bigger than most countries. Facebook proper is. But our ability to leave Facebook and go somewhere else is extremely fluid. So anything that causes them to lose an innovative edge is going to be really problematic. You've mentioned this already, and I wanted to dig into it a little more. It's about the current political climate. You know, I find it really, really interesting that it's been more right-leaning people that have complained about their voices not being spread on these social networks, although every study says that that's where a lot of the misinformation is coming from. There's a fire hose of information from things like the Daily Caller, all that stuff. And that that stuff engages people on Facebook an incredible amount. And yet the Democrats are now in the power. They generally seem to have much more appetite for antitrust stuff, right? Is that fair to say? How does that play into this? Well, okay. So whatever just happened, the idea of Democrats being more trust busting, more pro-union is generally false, I think, at this point in the game. I think the, unfortunately, and this is extremely unfortunate, both parties have gone towards courting a certain type of rich contributor. Democrats look to the Valley, they look to the progressive entrepreneur, whereas Republicans look to the heartland folks, the oil and gas, the coal, energy, that sort of thing. So they've left a lot of this stuff in the dust. So if we're talking about antitrust, monopolistic behavior, who are they going to go after? They're going to go after the folks that they're going to make the most inroads with their specific constituency. In this specific case with the Facebook and then bringing it up again, and this is similar to the TikTok motion. If you remember that, they're basically trying to shut down TikTok in the US because it's reporting directly to China. That's mostly just them making stuff up just for political points on this front. The days of monopolistic action and the monopolistic control, are, they're pretty much gone. So this is almost a theater to a degree. It's not the easiest answer to accept, but we have to think in those terms, especially when a broken up Facebook benefits nobody ultimately, and it actually hinders innovation to a great degree. What do you mean by that? How does that hinder innovation? Well, I mean, as you pointed out, the Bells, Microsoft, I believe Oracle had some antitrust issues in Europe. Not to get too deep in the politics of privacy, that sort of thing. But as you said, we're going to create a chilling effect for somebody like a Facebook who's saying to itself, okay, now I cannot buy a self-driving car unit to serve Facebook ads while you ride your Uber around or whatever, or like ride your car around. So I'm not going to invest in that. And the company that should be investing in that is the company with the most money, the company that can actually push that technology to its fullest because it has that treasure chest at its disposal. I guess that's the way to think about it. So what happens if we look at the dot-com boom and then sort of the startup boom that happened, it started about 2009 and kind of finished in 2014. You saw a lot of smaller companies grabbing a lot of cash and building things out and being acquired by bigger companies that can actually use the technology that they've built properly. That happened at Apple, that happened at Google, that happened at Facebook, that happened at Amazon. And simultaneously, all those companies started producing services that they could sell associated with the technologies that they were buying and using. AWS is a great example of that. You had a growth of AWS during that period that 
basically makes it so easy to start up a startup right now. That's competition. New companies are created all the time, all over the world. And history shows that if we don't keep innovating, someone will replace every company here today. And that change can often happen faster than you expect. It's kind of silly. You basically just press a few buttons and you've already got your app running, uh, which is pretty cool. It's really interesting you brought that company up because this is one of these things where several other antitrust investigations are going on. There's a lot of talk about it and it's all aimed at that who's who of big tech, Apple, Amazon, Google. One of the things people have said is you could totally break off AWS, which is Amazon Web Services from Amazon. It, it could be its own multi-billion dollar company. You mentioned, you said this was a theater, but does this Apple lawsuit signal that there is some real type of regulation coming from governments on these big tech companies. Is this a sign of that at least? In the US, I don't think so. The concern here is that the politicians have to come down on one side or the other. Do they use private company airwaves, quote unquote, to get their message out? Or do they try to create a public system for communicating that's not directly associated with these big communication companies? The idea that we can use the legal frameworks applicable to telecommunications, quite literally the POTS, plain old telephone system, broadcast TV, broadcast radio, and apply them to this modern era is laughable. That said, there's a lot to be said about a group of companies that are beholden to certain regulations associated with news gathering, associated with equal time for equal opinions, for educational content, that sort of thing. It's a nice to have, as it were, when it comes to that sort of thing. The sad thing is, I don't think we're going back to that era. And I think any political discussion about it is mostly posturing. Twitter is censoring, I don't know, diamond and silk or whatever here. And that makes us angry. And because Parler or Parler or whatever you want to call it is not a superior product, it's not getting used as much. So that's censorship too. You're going to have politicians flailing in a way that's very unappetizing and unappealing throughout the next, I don't know, 20 years, really, because they're not going to be able to catch up with this. What happens if the FTC or if any of this Facebook stuff goes to court is that you have a really nice long news cycle of Zuckerberg coming out and saying, Facebook's not a monopoly, and then somebody kind of half-heartedly saying it is, and then you get another Microsoft situation. It puts Facebook in an awkward position for a little while, which gives plenty of its competitors room to maneuver, which is another good or bad outcome of this. How does this impact the user at all? Is this going to be one of those things that's just high stakes? Does it actually get down to me and... No, no, no. Why not? I mean, look, in most of these cases, you don't notice the connections between these apps anyway. If, if you ask the average person out there what they thought of WhatsApp being bought by Facebook, they wouldn't be able to tell you the first thing about it because you don't notice it. It's not directly connected. Sure, you can maybe log in with using Facebook to WhatsApp, but that's neither here nor there. How it helps or harms the consumer is depends on how deeply you want to get into the connectedness of these things. If you're a privacy advocate, you don't use Facebook at all anyway. So you would avoid those tools. And there's plenty of alternative tools that you can use to replace Facebook's junk. So it doesn't really affect anybody ultimately. Again, it's political theater, which allows competitors to sneak in while Goliath is being buffeted by rocks by David. Well, John, I think that's really great for us. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you think that my listeners should know about this? I don't know. I mean, delete your Facebook account. You'll feel a lot better. I did it a couple years ago. (laughs) And then you don't have to worry about it anymore. On that note, I really, really want to thank you for your time today. All right. Thanks. John Biggs is the editor-in-chief of Gizmodo. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Rajin Budder, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etisaz. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is J.P. Foso. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.